for all universities throughout the UK and try and persuade our EU colleagues to adopt it throughout the European Union once we've established it successfully. Now, this is another project that I dreamed up when I was teaching in schools because, and I think it's long overdue. <laughs> you see, in schools, there is a gifted and talented scheme running, which was set up by Tony Blair, who did some good things when he was Prime Minister, and he is now 100% against Brexit, bless him. Um, his gifted and talented scheme in schools was, was great. It didn't go far enough. We need it also in universities because I've taught brilliant kids at school. They go off to university and they often, they don't get picked up because the standard of teaching in the universities is not always that high. Um, there are sort of placemen who just muddle along doing, the, doing the, the middling kind of delivery they can get away with. They're not really exciting and inspiring our young academics to ask deep questions. They're just trotting out a sort of delivery pat, um, patter. And so, no, gifted and talented scheme in all universities would, would realise that intelligence comes in different types. Some people are brilliant at music, as Howard Gardner said. Some are great at math, some are great at humanities, some are great at art or drama or music. You know, everybody is a genius, in my view, in a different way. Some are great at sport. Um, the thing is that the university sector should be the place where we inculcate and, and nurture the genius of the next generation and inspire it with yeah, that sense of wonder that you get when you study the greats. I mean, I loved my time at university the second time round. Bristol was dreadful because the teaching was so abysmally bad. They were like, I don't know, like dragons sitting on little eggs of knowledge that they were like shouting and throwing stuff at you if you tried to get anywhere near knowledge. Most, most scary experience of my life. These were not teachers, these were the opposite, uh, blockers. As Christ said of such people, you know, they, they won't let you into the kingdom of God and they block up the, the passage and throw away the keys. I hope Bristol University philosophy departments improved since the 70s. Um, I expect it has. But certainly we need gifted and talented schemes in all the universities of Britain. And then roll it out EU-wide. The joke is that I, I sent this idea to Boris Johnson when he was mayor of London. And... Um, you know, he, he never saw it. He just didn't get it. He, he, he wrote back through his underling. Well, let's, let's have it for STEM subjects. Let's have it for maths and sciences. Which is completely to fail to understand what the project is about. So, sorry, Boris. You didn't get it right first time. You're sacked. Let's do it now with the Bromain Alliance. Let's have a proper gifted and talented scheme for all universities. The current system is... If you're wealthy, you can get to Oxford. If you can get private education so you get good enough A-levels, you can get to Oxford. If you play the game and you join the kind of elite uh, circus that has just arrived from Eton and you've joined the Tory party and you, you kind of know who to wine and dine and before long you're adopted as a candidate. No, all that's ridiculous. That's not intelligence. That's, that's not moral progress. We need a genuine gifted and talented scheme to spot the genius in all students that come to university, to encourage it, and, and to... Because these are the kids who will then go on and, and crack travel than... Uh, sorry, space travel faster than light. These are the kids that will, will work out how to communicate with other intelligences around the universe faster than light. These are the kids that will work out how to find alternative energy systems that don't pollute the planet like nuclear does. These are the kids that will work out how to solve global warming and so on. We need our geniuses in the university sector. How can we get them if we don't look out for them and respect them enough to actually clock and, and recognise them? So there we are. The Bromain Alliance is what I'm proposing which is visionary, uh, but it's also just common sense, you know. And that's what parliamentarians have been totally lacking. These Tories, you look at them, there isn't a common sense uh, brain cell among them, apart from the few dissenters to Brexit. It's become a sort of nightmare of, of idiots trotting out a cult slogan. Um, so anyway, gift and talented scheme for all universities, right. Next thing, number 17, Bromain candidates would pledge to implement a Green New Deal. 
So all unemployed graduates and qualified candidates would be offered launch funding to contribute creatively to the economic advancement of the UK in a way conforming to environmental needs. Living off-grid and eco-homes would be encouraged. Planning restrictions on eco-homes would be much relaxed. Forest gardens and similar agricultural experiments would be encouraged. And so on. You know, a Green New Deal doesn't just mean a bit of tinkering around and a couple of bills in Parliament. It means a total shift in the way we look at our relationship to each other and to nature. It means a cooperative society, a sharing society, a society that repairs stuff instead of having sort of throw away, buy another, buy two, get one free kind of society. It means rethinking uh, the repair shops and so on that are available in our country. It means rethinking the MOT uh, racket for cars so that we keep our cars on the road instead of throwing them away because the window won't shut properly. Um, you know, so we repair cars. We totally transform the MOT system so it becomes an enabling thing to keep cars running, like in India. Um, we, we enable people to go and live in upland areas, to, to build eco-houses, to, to live off-grid, that they don't have to use up vast energy and be plugged into the grid. They can find ways of surviving. Um, things like forest gardens. My dear late friend Robert Hart, who wrote about forest gardens and pioneered living in Tropshire and Wenlock Edge in one, those kind of experiments should be encouraged and people should be encouraged to live in eco-homes and do those kind of things. That's what a Green New Deal is about. And then if you have a citizen's income scheme, then you can survive whilst you're in your pioneering phase until you get it to the point where it's self-funding. Uh, you know, self um, funding. That's number 17. Number 18. <clears throat> Remain candidates, if elected, would pledge to introduce strict regulations for the offshore banking and financial services industry. Such funds would all be taxed fairly and properly henceforth. Tax avoidance schemes would be dealt with rigorously and the law tightened up and enforced effectively against major corporations. A penny would be taxed on every single email exchanged on the internet passing through the UK and the money raised would be in the billions. It would also stop spam in its tracks. That's a big one, you know. A, the offshore banking nonsense that is largely, it would seem, behind the Brexit campaigning. Just tax these people. Work out deals with Jersey and the Cayman Islands, all these countries that are supposedly under the um, UK in some way, sort of under the crown. Well, they should have to, you know, tax their people fairly uh, or lose that status. And, and most of them do their deals, you know, in the City of London, use the City of London as a kind of imprimatur of authenticity, but then they find ways to hide the actual funding offshore and don't pay taxes. Well, all that's got to stop and be looked at and dealt with rigorously and fairly. The penny on email is simply a common sense approach. We all like to send emails. Well, why can't we pay a penny for them? If I send a letter, I pay whatever, you know, 90p or something. Well, why can't I pay just one penny per email? It would stop me sending out loads of junk emails and it would stop spam in its tracks because, because the a system would be put in place whereby the email, as it's sent, is automatically credited to your account, like a kind of franking machine system. And technologically, that could be done. Um, that would raise billions. Okay. <clears throat> um, Number 19, the National Health Service will be reaffirmed as an important service to the people of the UK and proper funding will be guaranteed long term. A new emphasis, however, will be put on preventing illness and a wider range of medical regimes will be made available, including alternative and complementary medicines such as homeopathy, acupuncture, Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, um, dietary advice, therapeutic massage, clinical hypnotherapy, psychotherapy, naturopathy, herbal medicine, spiritual healing and other parallel healing systems with proven capacity to heal patients with particular conditions. Patients using the NHS will be entitled to request such healing regimens. 
the NHS would be renamed the National Healing Service, with greater emphasis on the dynamics of healing and an acknowledgement of the importance of doctor-healer-patient relationships. Medical training for doctors and nurses would include options to include these healing practices in their tuition and clinical experiences. I feel really, you know, passionate about this, and I live, I, I, I worked in hospitals for six years, both in Canada and Britain. I, I know how medicine works. I've studied medicine. I've trained, you know, as a yeah, nursing orderly in Canada in a hospital, which was a six-month training, and I did basic physiology. I know how official hospitals think, and they do good jobs. You know, I'm not against hospitals, but I'm against the hospitalization of, of healing. I think healing is a subtle work, which genuine doctors do. And it's, it's a complex process, and it, it can involve many things, like Chinese medicine and Indian Ayurvedic or homeopathy. They're, they work on a much more subtle level, but they do work, and also spiritual healing as well. You have to be attuned, you have to be sensitive, you have to be open to it. But if you are, these things work. So by renaming the NHS the National Healing Service... We, we come away from this model of health as a, as a sort of package that we deliver, costing vast amounts of money, and see it more as a process of healing through relationships between the doctor with the expertise and the patient with the need, and a bond of trust between them, which allows healing energy to, to transform the patient's quality of life. You know. um, I notice that so many doctors, bless them, are shouting out against Brexit. They, they know it's going to be catastrophic. I see doctors posting, you know, if the Tories are re-elected, it's the end of the NHS. Yes, well, that's why we have to not elect them. But let's go ahead of that. Let's do even something better. Let's say, because I used to live in Peckham, where the NHS was invented with the Peckham experiment. The idea was that of community medicine, community healing. You can't just tackle... You know, if you have 10 patients come into your surgery and they've all got extended bellies because they're starving and they're eating grass, you know there's something wrong out in society. You can't just tackle it by giving them all pills. No, you have to solve the economic problems that are causing the extended bellies. So therefore, social approach to healing came in. And that was the NHS's birth. And, and we need to revisit that. But now, with the hindsight of of you know 60 years of accumulated clinical practice and so on evidence we we can realize that alternative medicine complementary medicine can be part of that overall package patients don't all get better if you just give them expensive medicines from pharmaceutical companies sometimes they might respond better with hypnotherapy there's the famous case of the scottish psychiatrist working in a london psychiatric hospital using um, clinical hypnotherapy to cure schizophrenics with serious hallucinatory problems and, and all kinds of mental illness that the drugs simply don't tackle. Um, medic medical massage, therapeutic massage, can also help kids with vast, you know, energy, ADHD type things, you know, calm them down, aromatherapy, works, works, works wonders. All these things can be, can be tried. And again, with, with mental health issues, instead of just drugging people to get rid of the symptoms, use, use psychotherapy, use clinical hypnotherapy. Um, we can be so much more creative in the way that the NHS is run. And actually, this is much cheaper because it would make us all weller. <laughs> A National Healing Service would, would give us the incentive to come alive again as a nation, to be healed. And, and to go forward out of this Brexit nightmare, this sort of, uh, yeah, this dark tunnel we've fallen into for the last three years, and pioneer some of the, the um, integration of conventional scientific medicine with, with alternative complementary. Now, it's something I've been working on for many years intellectually, and, and I know many other people have. The scientific and medical network is full of geniuses that, that know how this can be done. Well, let's integrate it in with the NHS system. And I know Prince Charles would be delighted at this. Um, so let's do it. OK. And I know David Tradinick, who's a great MP, I think, unfortunately for the Conservative Party and is standing down. I would like him to re-stand in the Bromain Alliance as an independent somewhere. Find him a seat 
and he could be part of, of the steering of this because he's been working on this for years with the all-party all group for complementary and alternative medicine. He's a great man and deserves, you know, um, a role in helping steer the NHS into becoming a national healing service. But he, he shouldn't be doing it in the Tory party. That's, that's a no-no. <laughs> OK, number 20. A new law guaranteeing safety to whistleblowers and truth-tellers reporting illegal and mendacious and malevolent actions in any part of the UK state apparatus or among nations with whom we're supposed to be in alliance. This new law would guarantee freedom from prosecution in the event of reporting wrongdoing, such as Catherine Gunn did for GCHQ, and would cover all branches of the police, intelligence services, judiciary, parliament, local and regional councils, etc. The same law would guarantee freedom of sanctuary to whistleblowers from other nations reporting on illegal actions by other governments or their state apparatuses. Any foreign whistleblowers seeking sanctuary in the UK, provided their case was genuine, would be guaranteed sanctuary and not deported. Julian Assange would be released under this legislation. Immediately the Remain Reform Alliance came into office following a December 12th election victory. Now I feel passionate about this, as I know many other people do. Um, the, the mistreatment of Assange, who's simply a whistleblower, who is pointing out how diabolical American foreign policy had become, with WikiLeaks he was able to, you know, find a way of getting that information out to the public. He deserves, you know, a knighthood. I think as an Australian citizen he's entitled to a knighthood. Sir Julian Assange should be let out of prison the minute the Remain Alliance get into power and, and given a knighthood and given convalescence and, you know, a pension for life. I don't know. And, and, but it's about safeguarding so that future whistleblowers come through. Now, of course, you might say, oh, God, this is shocking. Can't have this. Because people, you know... Uh, <clears throat> well, I'm sorry, we have to, because people have to be enabled to tell the truth. Obviously, you weed out fake whistleblowers if, if you know, like these fake paedophile allegations that have surfaced that, you know, claim that half the parliamentarians were all having sex in, in Dolphin Square and blah, blah. You know, it turned out to be a nutter. Well, you work out who are the genuine whistleblowers from the nutters. But once you've done that, you, you give genuine sanctuary and support to whistleblowers. We need new legislation to enable that. And the climate should go you know, back to freedom of thought, freedom of speech. That's what, that's what liberalism is all about. That's why my ancestors fought in 1688, uh, you know, in crucial times in British history to guarantee freedom of thought, freedom of speech. That's why John Locke and the Glorious Revolution brought in this concept. It's in our, uh, you know, it's, it's the closest we have to a constitution the Bill of Rights, which gives me rights to speak out to you as I'm doing. It gives me freedom from arbitrary arrest or torture and so on. Those, those rights need to be defended, and that includes the right of that chap to explain that that guy is being corrupt and, and doing illegal and wicked things, and not to be, you know, found mysteriously hanging under a bridge, like in Sparta with the Cryptia, where they just would kill off dissidents. No, this is a democracy. This is Athens, people. We have a duty to speak out, as Pericles said. Otherwise, what's, what's the point of defending it? What's, what's the use? Well, no, I love Athens. I love Pericles. And I will defend my right to speak out truth. And I will defend the right of other people to speak truth, including Assange and Edward Snowden and all the others. Uh, as an Australian citizen, we should be fighting for Assange's rights. He's a Commonwealth citizen. Uh, I feel deeply ashamed at how this British establishment, which is full of rogues and crooks, have been persecuting him. Enough said. That's number 20. Number 21. It will be made a criminal offence for lawyers to lie or act mendaciously on behalf of clients or at their bidding in any court or judicial process in the UK. Ethical education and instruction in the history and philosophy of law will also be made mandatory for all trainee lawyers, solicitors and barristers throughout the UK. 
I've written to the head of the legal profession in, in England several times and asked, can lawyers lie in courts if their clients, you know, ask them to, or even if they don't? Never got a clear answer. Total ambiguity. It seems to me that lawyers are entitled to lie if they think they can advance their client's case, and they do. Or they find ways of subtly twisting the truth in a way that is effectively a lie. It's a grey area. <clears throat> no absolute clarity. So what I'm saying is the Bromain Alliance needs to absolutely be clear about this. We have to have lawyers that only tell the truth in courts. Otherwise, how can we trust anyone? You know, um, how can we trust the Attorney General who gets up and says blah, 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 if we know that he's entitled to lie? And he's saying, well, I can't talk about this. This is sub judice. Yes, I might have said that, blah, blah, blah. But of course, I can't say anything because blah, 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 it's all sub judice. And, of, you know, no, cut through all that. All lawyers, up to the Attorney General and the Supreme Court, have a duty to tell only the truth in courts, henceforth, throughout the entire kingdom. Um, and all judges as well, obviously. Um, and obviously all... Um, uh, you know, um, jurors and so on. <clears throat> so, simple, straightforward, absolutely clear. This would transform the way the legal system operates because at the moment it's, it operates with, with greyness and ambiguity and, and lawyers kind of use courts like a kind of cult to promote their own advancement rather than actually helping the client who may be falsely arrested, falsely accused and is suffering terrible pain in prison. Like Assange, you know, the poor chap being hauled before this, this sham of a court. Um, <clears throat> so this would totally transform it. I, I know of a case in Wales, for instance, and I've worked as a mediator, that's why I know about these things, um, in, in the, you know, on the fringes of the legal um, process. And I, I was once at a trial in Wales, in um, Montgom uh, no, in um, Welshpool, and um, my, my friend, who wasn't actually my client, but, you know, a mediation client, had been um, <clears throat> stitched up, totally missold. Her lawyer wasn't properly defending her. She'd popped out. And the lawyer, her lawyer, supposedly defending her and prosecuting somebody for theft, then suddenly just collapsed. The case collapsed, and she was found... Um, not to have won the case, and the case was dismissed, and the criminal, who'd been a thief, was allowed to just walk out with no consequences. And I asked the clerk at the court afterwards, I said, what, what on earth happened there? Why did, why did her lawyer suddenly, like, give in like that? And he said, oh, you know, they're old friends, those two lawyers. They just wanted to, to get home early and forget about the case. I mean... <laughs> That shows the kind of lack of professionalism in our legal um, thing. And so the man had been lying deliberately, knowing that my client was uh, innocent of what was alleged and yet let it go through. So that's the sort of thing, that, that shoddy behaviour which goes on in courts throughout the land would be nipped in the bud utterly and totally for all time. And lawyers would be brought to heel to behave ethically because they would no longer be allowed to lie or act mendaciously in courts. Um, number <clears throat> 22, the silencing of discussion in Parliament of cases and issues which are being investigated legally as sub judice will be ended. Parliamentary discussion will supersede and take precedence over all legal procedures underway. And free and unfettered discussion of all issues, with truth-telling being mandatory, will be resumed in the Mother of Parliaments. Likewise, the parliamentary protocol that does not permit MPs to take on cases for people who live outside their constituencies will be ended. All MPs can respond, if they wish, to communications from any UK citizen and deal with the issues as they see fit. It might be an issue they're personally interested in, in which case they would work with the citizen's local MP to get some forward movement on the issue. Now this, this paragraph 22 is two issues. It's one... The business about this, I can't talk about it sub judice. I've mentioned that before. So this this replaces that with, with no, Parliament is the place of last resort where truth is told. 
and everything is up for discussion, not not left to the courts. Um, <clears throat> and and this principle of free discussion, free speech in Parliament, therefore takes precedence over, can't talk about it, it's sub to say no, sorry, it's Parliament is the mother church of democracy, so to speak. The second point is this question about parliamentary protocol of not dealing with issues if you're not in the MP's um, constituency. This is, I've tried to clarify this with the Speaker John Burkow and, and um, we've exchanged emails and so on because when you live in Europe and you're you know, watching with horror what's being done about your country, you want to contact MPs whose thinking is similar to yours, who you think are intelligent. That Labour MP speaking up from wherever, that person is a genius, I want to write to them. Or that Green MP in Brighton, she's a genius, she's talking about environmental issues. Or that MP in Wales, they really understand about, you know, education or whatever. Now I think that all UK citizens should be entitled to write to any MP or Lord and expect a sensible, decent answer on matters of policy and general politics. Um, I mean, what if I'm a Green, say, living in Scotland, and I don't have any Green MPs apart from dear old Caroline Lucas, and yet I know that the local council is dumping trash into the water supply. I will want to raise this with Caroline Lucas as my Green. Um, now, I think that legislation should should supersede this this fictional parliamentary protocol, which isn't a law, it's just that if you write to an MP about something, you always get back this automatic spam thing that says, if you're not in my constituency, go away, I'm not interested, because it's parliamentary protocol. Well, I think that's rude. These people are on vast salaries. They have huge influence and power. The protocol should be changed so that it is... And, and some say this, Leila Moran, for instance, who's the education spokesman for the Lib Dems, has a much more subtle spam response. She says, if it's about education policy, I'd be very happy to you know, respond in due course. But if it's a case, then I can't take it on unless you're in my constituency. Well, that's a distinction that's very important. And I agree with that. Because you know, if, if I've been arrested and beaten up and, and um, abused by local council and the local council aren't allowing me to look at the archives, then yes, I go to my local MP who can raise the matter. But if I want to raise the issues of bullying and abuse in, in, in state organs, then I might want to write to the Lib Dem spokesman for human rights or whatever, who isn't my MP, but has an, a knowledge of the issues. I should be entitled to do that and to expect a civilised response. And that person would then work with my local MP, who might be whatever, you know, party. So I think we, we need a much more joined up parliament where, where groups and clusters of MPs come together to work on particular issues in the interests of particular citizens who might be flagging them and raising them as issues. For instance, my gifted and talented scheme for um, higher education, you know, all the higher education spokesmen of all parties could be involved in looking and drafting legislation on that. And in a Bromain parliament, if we can get a progressive alliance elected, then they would all be invited in to play a role in that. Um, <clears throat> so that, that is about the, the... It's about freeing up communication between us, the public, citizens, and politicians in parliament who sit and lord it over us, and yet too often have been completely ignorant, ill-educated, misadvised, and, and acting in totally Machiavellian ways that are not in the interest of the British people at all. And their worst ever um, mistake was to go with this Brexit monster, in my opinion. Uh, number 23. State pensions will be increased 100% in size by the Bromain Reform Alliance, as a way of giving thanks to the elderly people of Britain, who've sacrificed so much for the current generation. Women and men will be treated equally in all pension matters. The pensionable age will be set at 65 and kept there indefinitely for both men and women. If people want to go on working after that age, they can, of course. This is a uh, matter I feel strongly about. I've worked a lot with old people. I used to work in geriatric hospitals. I've had lots of friends who've been my mentors who are elderly 
in academia, I've worked with Tony Weaver, who died when I was there in his presence, an older academic, but a man of great wisdom and stature. And I've sat at the feet of, you know, many great elderly people. Elderly people are amazing. They have so much wisdom to impart. We should honour them, and the least we can do is give them a decent pension. Now, I'm shocked that in Britain, the pension is is tiny in comparison to other European countries, in France and Germany and elsewhere. If we doubled it, it wouldn't even match what they get in France and Germany, which, which are countries that respect their elders. And I think this all goes, you know, it's all a package. Disrespect for elders is part of the kind of cutthroat it's called political an anarchy, the, the ideas of Dominic Cummings, but I wouldn't even give them that um, title. You know, anarchy is quite an interesting political philosophy. It's not, it's, it's, it's just, um, you know, destructionism, I think, is the word I would coin for the Cummings Brexit position. Destroy, destroy, destroy. It's like a sort of Dalek gone mad. Destroy the EU, destroy the UK, destroy the Conservative Party, destroy everything. Destructivism. <clears throat> And that includes destroy the old generation, you know. Who needs them? They're old people. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> they are the residual of the wisdom. I mean, some of my mentors, you know, fought from World War II. A lot of my patients that I nursed, they, they made me a peace activist. I saw the horrors of it through their eyes. Um, some fought in World War I, people I nursed. And I'm still working on solving the mystery of who authorised World War I. On behalf of uh, Mr. Bonthron of, of Calgary, who, who sent me back to Britain to find out. Well, I think there's a new book by some Scottish historians proved it was a conspiracy, Mr. Bonthron. You were right. <laughs> and it's, you know, <laughs> I still think there should be crimes in, in um, you know, posthumously for that one. Um, <clears throat> double the pension age, sorry, double the pension allowance. It still wouldn't be as much as they get in European countries. I think all old people deserve a pension. Obviously, if they've got vast private savings, then then um, you know you, you don't you don't do that. I, I'm not sure the person could then give back. Um, those those are details that need tweaking. But um, generally speaking, the pension should be doubled. Number twenty four. UK foreign policy will shift a hundred percent towards a peace oriented policy with emphasis on resolving and healing conflicts in nations around the world, with a priority on Commonwealth countries, but also throughout the Middle East, and wherever countries are experiencing civil wars or violent conflicts. The UK will make available its three centuries of experience in building and maintaining the largest empire the world has ever known, and give advice and help and assistance to all countries who ask for mediation and peacemaking assistance. The UK will support the coming into being of the European Union Mediation Service and make its expertise in conflict resolution and mediation available to it also. The UK will also support and advance peacemaking and mediation structures inside the UN and help bring into being a UN international mediation service. The UK will double its contributions to the UN and towards UNESCO and help set up an education aid programme through UNESCO, whereby all children in participating countries are given a special day off per year for fundraising education aid on the model of live aid. This is, you know, an important paragraph. They all are, but this is one very close to home. So... I've watched in horror, really, the UK Foreign Office and, and, and foreign policy is, is all about, you know, buying influence and using subterfuge and covert 